Hello, my name is Andrew Harvey and my colleague who you'll hear from uh, shortly is uh, Richard Griscom. And welcome to our talk entitled, Who are the Hadza? A Linguistic Perspective. Um, the question, who are the Hadza, presupposes that people, especially African people, can be easily subdivided and that the primary or most meaningful subdivision is that of tribe or ethnic group. In fact, the question, who are the Hadza, is not really a question for us as non-Hadza to answer. More appropriate way to phrase this question is, who has been counted as Hadza by Western academia? A corollary of this is to ask, what effects has that had? This talk provides an initial account of our ongoing language documentation project, specifically in terms of where Hadza is spoken, who Hadza is spoken by. Uh, due to the type of questions we're seeking to answer, which focuses on who speaks Hadza rather than who has traditionally been characterized as Hadza, the picture of the Hadza people which emerges from our research methodology is strikingly different from many of those previously given. Uh, sketches situating the Hadza language in its social contexts and contrast with past accounts will be drawn throughout. One goal of this talk is linguistic, discussing new findings on a language and speaker community for which there has been little documentation. And another goal is to address past assertions which have systemically erased large portions of the Hadza people. We'd like to start, however, with a short video taken during a recent period of fieldwork with speakers of Hadza, simply to give you, our listeners, an idea of what the language sounds like. This particular video features Agnes Benjamin, Satomo Chausiku Lemi, and Elinori Isaya Mile digging edible roots near the Hukumako camp, and then a clip of Fama Lameki Lucas Shoyo, Kwanusi Tawashibuluku, and Ishububo Endeko Ndurumo, a bit further afield from Hukumako camp, looking for honey and game. <laughs> Indeed, this video features what would be considered traditional Hadza activities, ones which have been described by various researchers as central to the Hadza way of life and identity for a very long time, indeed. For example, Nicholas Blurton Jones cites Frank Marlowe in the observation that the Hadza people today are much unchanged over the last 100 years. He says uh, Marlowe has pointed out that day to day, Hadza behavior, economy, and technology appear just as described in Erich Obst's uh, 1911 account. Um, in terms of concrete examples, the descriptions given here are common in the literature. So, all Hadza travel around by foot. There were two bicycles briefly. Uh, modern communications, even where they exist, are not accessible to Hadza. And uh, Hadza have little to adapt to but their environment and each other. Um, most of our listeners will appreciate that these are very strong claims. Indeed, other researchers, in this case, both of whom are involved with studying the physiology of the Hadza people, typically will begin their discussions of why they chose to work with the Hadza with a hedge, like the ones bolded here. Nevertheless, the Hadza people are still seen by these researchers as vital models for Paleolithic man. So we see here in Schnorr et al. 2014, uh, we get, while the Hadza are a modern human population, they live in a key geographic region for studies of human evolution and target resources similar to those exploited by our hominin ancestors. The Hadza lifestyle, therefore, is thought to most closely resemble that of Paleolithic humans. And uh, Ponser, quoted in Smith, uh, notes that while nobody lives exactly like humans did 10,000 years ago, the Hadza's way of life is perhaps the least changed. Returning to Marlowe 2002, the book asserts that the Hadza are living fossils. In a talk given by both of us last year, that's uh, Harvey Griscom 2019, we examine how this academic narrative has had a negative impact on the Hadza people, especially in terms of providing justification for invasive research 
as well as unsustainable tourism practices. And in the same breath, Marlowe puts the onus of proving that this is not the case onto other researchers. So we see him saying of, uh, of the living fossils uh, comparison, he says, it's wrong to think of foragers as living fossils if aspects of their cultures have changed appreciably. If that is what one wants to argue, one must present evidence of such change. So this is part of what we would like to do today. So as such, this talk will feature five subsections. Uh, in the first, we will present a brief account of previous academic accounts of the Hadza people, and in the process, identify a common underlying narrative that has developed. In the second, we will give a brief account of our current research projects, highlighting how our questions and methodologies are different from previous studies carried out by others. In the third subsection, we will describe what we have learned about where Hadza has spoken and how this contrasts with past accounts. In the fourth subsection, we will describe what we've learned thus far about who Hadza is spoken by and, once again, how this contrasts with past accounts. The final subsection concludes. So uh, let's start with uh, previous academic accounts of the Hadza. Um, the academic research on the Hadza people stretches back over a hundred years, and as such, what we present should be viewed as a curated selection of this. A more complete list of works can be found in the Rifali bibliography. So when laid out in a timeline, we can review some of these major publications and see some eras and movements corresponding with the wider intellectual and cultural climate of the day. So for example, much of the earliest work is authored by colonial explorers. The mid-20th century sees the rise of more recognizable modern anthropology, and James Woodburn's 1964 dissertation is still seen as a locus classicus for much of what we know of the Hadza today. The late 20th century sees the advent of evolutionary anthropological approaches, perhaps the most significant contribution being made by Nicholas Burton Jones. Uh, the early part of our century sees further attention in this vein, now with the addition of modern genetics. Uh, comments on how the conversation on the Hadza people is intertwined with that of the Kung people of Southern Africa, and especially the Kalahari debate, can be seen in Richard and my 2019 presentation. What we see emerging out of this century of scholarship is not only the establishment of the Hadza as an ethnic group complete with a homeland, a language, and a history, but also the assertion of the Hadza people as radically unique among and radically separate from the other groups of the area. In terms of where the Hadza live, we have reports like these in Blurton Jones 2019. All the Hadza spent many years of their childhood and of their adult lives living in the bush as hunters and gatherers. No generation has grown up without experience of life in the bush. And very few Hadza live outside eastern Hadza country. In terms of who speaks Hadza, we have descriptions like these. Uh, so, for example, we know of no Hadza who owns a goat, a sheep, a cow, or a donkey. And... Among the eastern Hadza, about 200 to 300 still live almost exclusively from hunting game, collecting honey, digging tubers, and gathering berries and baobab fruit. The remaining 450 to 550 eastern Hadza shift between foraging and various other activities. Some Hadza guard the maize fields of their neighbors from animals. Some Hadza do labor on two large European farms in the Mongola area. From time to time, a Hadza may work as a game scout or work for the game department. Few Hadza have paid government positions as community development officers. A growing number of Hadza depend on tourist money. The resulting narrative is therefore of Hadza culture as insular, in that the Hadza people have little meaningful contact with or exposure to outside groups, and conservative, in that Hadza people have undergone little change over time. We will make the argument here that this narrative has served to, systemic, uh, to systemically erase large portions of the Hadza people and show how the data coming from our current projects focused on speakers of an underdocumented language has been providing new insights, uh, particularly because it's empowering local people to do their own research uh, on their own communities and uh, therefore represent themselves as they see fit and as they conceive themselves.
and Richard's going to talk a little bit more about the details of our project in the next section. Our two coordinated and community-based language documentation projects are based in northern Tanzania and funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. The first, led by Andrew Harvey, as seen on the right, is titled Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu, Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift. The second, led by myself, Richard Griscom, as seen on the left, is titled Documenting Hadza, Language Contact and Variation. Together, these two two-year projects involve the participation of 10 local researchers from the Ihanzu and Hadza indigenous communities distributed across six research stations in the Lake Eyasi Basin. At the beginning of our two projects, we held a language documentation workshop during which members of the Gorwa community who already had experience with language documentation pass on their skills and knowledge to the new local researchers. The Hadza local researchers use audio recorders, microphones, video cameras, and computers to create their own annotated audiovisual recordings, which are deposited in the Endangered Languages Archive. To support the local researcher teams who installed solar panels at each station and provided additional technical support whenever necessary. Here you can see a sample of some of the recordings created by the Hadza local researchers. Okay. <laughs> Where is Hadza spoken? You might think that it is a bit odd answering this question in the middle of a linguistics presentation rather than at the beginning, but the reason is that the answer is actually somewhat complex. Generally speaking, we can say that Hadza is spoken in the East African country of Tanzania in the area to the southeast and the northwest of Lake Eyasi, as seen in the satellite image on the right. The area in which Hadza is spoken has actually changed quite dramatically over the past century, however. As recently as 60 years ago, the Hadza occupied a large swath of land, which now includes portions of the Maswa Game Reserve, Ngorongoro Conservation Area, and Yaida Valley. Today, however, the Hadza have rights to use only a small portion of this area, and the vast majority of it is now occupied by others. The loss of land poses a serious threat to the traditional foraging lifestyle of the Hadza, and efforts to secure land use agreements continue to this day. During the first stage of our two projects, we visited each of the points you see here on the map. The house icons indicate where the Hadza research stations are located, and the hiker icons indicate the locations of the few camps that we visit. The remaining icons indicate the location of villages and towns. A brief survey of the literature on the Hadza reveals an emphasis on those who reside in the least densely populated areas of the Lake Yazid Basin, sometimes with the explicit exclusion of those who reside or have resided elsewhere. During our project, however, most of the Hadza that we met and worked with did not live in the bush, but rather on the periphery of the bush, in a network of small villages. It is in these peripheral environments that we'd like to describe in more detail. Here's a photo, for example, of the village of Domanga, which is a quiet village on the edge of the bush where Hadza, Datoga, Ihanzu, and Tsukuma co-reside. The brick building in the photo is the home and personal shop of a Hadza couple who regularly work with an ecotourism company to bring foreign tourists to visit Hadza camps. And behind the bushes to the left is an open field in the middle of the village where villagers play football together on many evenings. There's also a village football team, which on our first visit had successfully won second place in a local tournament. Some Hadza live here permanently and practice agriculture while others come and go to and from the bush. There's also an airstrip at the edge of the village where 2G mobile internet is also accessible. This is a photo of the center of Mongo Amono village on the other side of the Aida Valley. This is where Hadza, Datoga, and Iraq live together. In the center of Mongo Amono is a large mobile communications tower which gives residents access to 3G mobile internet. 
If any of the Hazza living here, regularly participate in tourism activities, and some frequently travel to nearby towns such as Bashai and Haida. This is a photo of Barazani, Mongola, the center of the most urban environment in which the Hadza reside, together with other inhabitants from all over Tanzania. This town has exploded in size in the past two decades due to intensive agriculture and tourism. 3G internet is accessible throughout most of Mongola, as is electricity and piped water. This is a photo of a village quarter of Sungu, to the northwest of Lake Yasi. This is one of the more remote villages that Hadza live in. And here, Hadza co reside with Sukuma, and they manage livestock and farm. We did, of course, meet Hadza in the bush, living in camps that somewhat match descriptions that were read in the ethnographic record. But there were a number of differences. In this camp, for example, which is called Hukumako, most of the inhabitants had established a more or less permanent residence in the camp, and many of them regularly left the bush to go to Damanga. What is more, in Hukumako, there are a number of Hadza who are practicing agriculture, as you can see here. The Hadza camp we experienced then was not a true bush camp, but something more like the beginnings of a small village. Another emphasis in the literature on the Hadza is their subsistence and social behaviors. It is often proposed that Hadza exclusively practice a foraging subsistence strategy and only in marginal or insignificant cases practice agriculture or animal domestication. It is also often proposed that the Hadza do not interact with others, and when they do, they essentially become non-Hadza. No room is given for the Hadza to change. We must either stay the same or cease to be Hadza. Of course, we've experienced something quite different. In our work, we've encountered people who identify as Hadza and also farm, keep animals, and live in ethnically diverse communities. One of the Hadza local researchers, Deco Simon, holds a long-term contract with an international NGO and regularly travels to the city of Arusha for business meetings. Another Hadza researcher, Mariamo Anyawide, lives permanently in Mongola, where she works as a research assistant for anthropologists and linguists and serves as a local tour guide and community leader. Shani Mongola is a Hadza man with a Twitter account and a master's from the University of Arizona. And now, as we wind this talk up and draw our conclusions, I expect that some of you, our listeners, may have felt that this was not a very linguistic talk at all. Indeed, we've spent precious little time talking about the Hadza language. What we have talked about, however, is the Hadza speech community, and particularly the, the unexpected diversity we encountered when engaging with it. A common perspective adopted in the anthropological literature is that those who identify as Hadza constitute a closed culturally conservative and homogeneous population. The same properties are sometimes even explicitly stated as requirements for establishing a suitable study population. What makes this a linguistic talk is that from our perspective, the proposal that any human population is truly homogeneous is not an easily defensible position. And indeed, having approached our population with this linguistic perspective from the beginning, we find that this is also the case for the Hadza. What we have found is that those who identify as Hadza constitute a diverse and dynamic population undergoing rapid change. And while some of the contrasts between our observations and those of previous researchers has to do with when the work was carried out, for example, much of Nicholas Blurton Jones's work was carried out in the 80s and 90s, this is not the only factor. Existing linguistic research shows multiple examples of how the Hadza people must have been in significant sustained contact with neighboring groups since the arrival of those groups in the Yasi Basin. I think of Kirk Miller's work showing that Hadza kinship terms are largely borrowed, as well as works by Bonnie Sands and Tom Guldemann, both asserting that the Hadza ought not to be thought of as fitting neatly into the old trope of click-speaking or Khoisan ancient hunter-gatherer population. As such, this contrast between our observations and those of previous researchers raises larger questions about the underlying social incentives for promoting the idea of an exceptionally culturally conservative ethnic group. Who stands to gain 
from continuing to promote the belief that the Hadza are living fossils, despite evidence to the contrary, and who stands to lose? We argue that it is not only the Hadza community that stands to lose when the lived reality of its members is misrepresented, but also the academic community. We hope that our observations will serve as a reminder that it is not our place to confine anyone to a certain type of environment or activity, and doing so will almost always render our descriptions, be they linguistic, anthropological, or otherwise, poorer as a result. Thank you, and these are our references.